It's the most memorable story in the Book of Exodus, but also one of the most puzzling. How did the story of the plagues of Egypt come about, and what message did its authors want to convey? A closer look at the Bible, including some seemingly unrelated passages, reveals secrets about the story's history. If you've ever been to Sunday school, you probably remember the story in Exodus that tells of the ancient Israelites living as slaves in Egypt until a Hebrew man named Moses is chosen by God to free them. Over and over, Moses demands that the Egyptian Pharaoh let the Israelites go. And each time, when Pharaoh refuses, Moses and his brother Aaron summon a plague to demonstrate God's power. Pharaoh finally relents after the tenth plague and allows the Israelites to leave. This tale culminates with the Red Sea crossing and the destruction of Pharaoh and his army. Now, when the plagues are first introduced, the text refers to them as signs and wonders, and the word plague only occurs four times in the story. Furthermore, there are actually at least 11 of these plagues and or wonders, since the story's structure treats the miracle with Aaron's staff turning into a serpent as the first wonder. Speaking of structure, most of the plagues follow a fixed formula but they don't all follow the same formula. For example, some of them start with an order directed at Moses by God. They feature the command, let my people go. The Israelites are specifically spared from the plague, and the plague ends when Moses prays to God at Pharaoh's request. However, other plagues start with instructions from God to Aaron via Moses. Yes, the frog and blood plagues feature two commands, more on that in a moment. Aaron uses his staff to perform the wonder, and the Egyptian magicians are on hand to mimic the wonder, turning the encounter into a duel between opposing miracle workers. In fact, this is one of those classical biblical texts that clearly shows a merger of different sources. Most scholars believe that the first version of this story had only seven plagues, which are often attributed to an author called the Yahwist. Inspired by this story, a later author known as the Priestly Author wrote his own story involving five plagues, two of which were similar to the original seven. An editor then merged both versions into a unified narrative and inserted the Plague of Darkness into the Locust Plague. This theory finds support from Psalm 78, which seems to have been composed before the final redaction of Exodus. Its description of Jewish history includes the seven plagues known to the Yahwist, but none of the priestly plagues. The Blood Plague provides a great example of how the two stories were combined. The Plague of Blood, traditionally numbered as the first of the Ten Plagues, contains subtle contradictions in its current form. But if separated according to its distinctive Yahwist and priestly elements, it forms two independent and internally consistent plague episodes. In the Yahwist version, only the water of the Nile is turned to blood, which has the effect of killing all the fish. The rotting fish make the Nile undrinkable, forcing the Egyptians to dig for water. The priestly version, however, doesn't involve fish. Instead, Aaron stretches out his staff over all the waters of Egypt, its rivers, canals, ponds, pools, and even the pots and barrels, turning all fresh water into blood. Combining these two fairly different episodes together, as we see in the final version of Exodus, introduces problems like whether it was Moses or Aaron who performed the miracle, and how the Egyptians could dig wells for water when even the water in pools and pots was turned to blood. The singular pronoun he in verse 20 is also a clue. In the final text, it is ungrammatical because it follows a statement about both Moses and Aaron, but it originally referred to Moses alone in verse 14. Old Testament scholar Thomas Raymer, among others, has shown that the priestly version of the plagues was probably written as a standalone story. Reading the priestly plagues in isolation creates a single, coherent narrative about a miracle contest between Aaron and the magicians of Pharaoh. In fact, reading just the priestly writer's story on its own, one is struck by the hyperbolic and, frankly, zany nature of the tale. Furthermore, while the Yahwist plagues are carried out by Yahweh with Moses as his spokesperson, the wonders in the priestly story are depicted like magic tricks performed directly by Aaron using his staff like a magic wand with other physical materials in the environment as props. It starts with Aaron throwing down his staff in dramatic fashion and having it turn into a snake. 
Of course, Pharaoh's magicians are able to match the miracle. Aaron's snake does win the first challenge by eating the other snakes, but some scholars think this part is a gloss. For the second challenge, Aaron stretches out his staff over all the rivers, streams, pools, and ponds of Egypt, transmogrifying them into blood. Since this is all taking place in Pharaoh's presence, with no break in the story, it's not clear in physical terms what Aaron is doing. Is he just jabbing his staff in different directions, or is he dashing around the countryside, seeking out every last puddle of water? At any rate, the Egyptian magicians again replicate the miracle, and the fact that they have clean water to use suggests that Aaron's feat was a temporary effect, and not something that afflicted the country for any notable period of time. Next, the frogs. Aaron again holds out his staff over the rivers, pools, and ponds of Egypt, and makes frogs come forth from the water, almost like some kind of spontaneous generation. Pharaoh's magicians again perform the same feat with their secret arts, so the score remains three points per side. For his fourth wonder, Aaron stamps the ground with his staff, and the dust of the ground turns to gnats. You might have noticed that all these feats follow a certain physical logic. The water produces frogs because frogs are wet and live in water. The dust turns into gnats because gnats resemble specks of dust and live in the dirt. This time, the magicians are unable to replicate the feat, and they describe Aaron's staff with awe as the finger of God. Lastly, Aaron takes a handful of soot from a kiln and gives it to Moses, who throws it into the air. The cloud of soot immediately covers the entire land of Egypt, inflicting boils on people and animals. The magicians also suffer from the boils, and their condition makes them unable to attempt the same miracle. Again, we have the strange exaggeration of a handful of ash somehow blanketing all of Egypt, just as Aaron was able to wave his staff over all the rivers and ponds of Egypt. This lively, bigger-than-life yarn is clearly intended by the priestly author to entertain rather than to recount plain historical events. The priestly contest of magicians concludes in 1110, setting up the final confrontation and escape across the Red Sea. Moses and Aaron performed all these wonders before Pharaoh, but Yahweh hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the people of Israel go out of his land. Interestingly, none of the films about the plagues of Egypt that I've seen depict this contest as described in Exodus. They usually either just reveal the Egyptian magicians as frauds, or else they skip the contest of magicians altogether. It's sad that biblical films so often change or omit the most interesting details in the interest of satisfying their audience. So if the priestly writer based his story about dueling magicians on the Yahwist story of seven plagues, where did the Yahwist story come from? Some might claim it was an actual historical event, or an oral retelling of natural phenomena, or even a novel invention of the writer. The explanation preferred by scholars today, however, is that it was composed using similar passages from other parts of the Bible. This was proposed in a landmark 1986 paper by Canadian scholar John Van Cedars, who identified several sources behind the Yahwist plague story. Moses as Prophet The character of Moses, both as Yahweh's messenger and as a performer of wonders, is based on the prophets of other Old Testament books, including Jeremiah, Samuel, and Isaiah. The theme of God causing stubbornness in his opponents is particularly found in Isaiah 6. The phrase, So you may know that I am Yahweh, constantly repeated in the plague story, may come from Ezekiel. The slain shall fall in your midst, then you shall know that I am Yahweh. Go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his officials, so that you may know that I am Yahweh. The Diseases of Egypt Deuteronomy was written before Exodus and contains no mention or knowledge of the plagues of Egypt. However, Van Cedars identified an earlier biblical tradition in Deuteronomy and Ezekiel according to which it was the Israelites who suffered from Egyptian diseases. The details of this tradition are now lost to us, but vestiges remain in at least four verses. Yahweh will turn away from you every illness, all the dread diseases of Egypt that you experienced. He will not inflict on you. Yahweh will inflict you with the boils of Egypt. He will bring back upon you all the diseases of Egypt of which you were in dread. Then I thought I would pour out my wrath upon them and spend my anger against Israel in the midst of the land of Egypt. There is no suggestion in these passages that diseases were used as divine punishment against the Egyptians, but the Yahwist has reinterpreted them that way. If you will listen carefully to the voice of Yahweh your God, 
I will not bring upon you any of the diseases that I brought upon the Egyptians. In other words, the Yahwehs took a tradition about plagues that were used as punishment against Israel for its disobedience and made it about the Egyptians instead. Assyrian Vassal Treaties Near Eastern Vassal Treaties, and particularly the Treaties of Esarhaddon, included a section where grave curses were threatened against the vassal if they rebelled against the king. These curses included drought, famine, disease, body sores, sterility for humans and animals, locusts, and darkness. Yahweh's covenant with Israel in Deuteronomy 28, which describes a long list of curses as punishment for disobedience, is clearly patterned after such treaties, and Leviticus 26 reworks that passage into a series of curses interspersed with opportunities for the hearer to repent. These curses include illness, pest-ridden crops, boils, darkness, the death of children and livestock, and enslavement. Van Cedars believes the Yahwist took inspiration from these cursed traditions in order to compose the Exodus story of plagues and Pharaoh's refusal to repent. What's particularly striking is that Leviticus promises a sevenfold curse to those who remain disobedient. This makes the connection with the Yahwist's story of seven plagues inescapable, says Van Cedars. If you continue hostile to me and will not obey me, I will continue to plague you sevenfold for your sins. In other words, the story of the plagues as we have it demonstrates a long process of development that began with Assyrian vassal treaties and an obscure tradition about Egyptian diseases. Van Cedars concludes, There is no primary and secondary material, no ancient oral tradition behind the text. The plagues narrative did not exist as a specific tradition before the Yahwists' work and is, therefore, no older than the exilic period. The only plague not assigned to either the Yahwist or the priestly writer is the darkness, which most experts attribute to a later editor. Its juxtaposition with the locust plague may be due to the fact that the locusts darkened the earth from their numbers. The plague story is also notable for the pseudo-scholarly theories that are often used to explain it. It's worth knowing what they are and why they are wrong. One perennially popular approach among people with training in the natural sciences but not in history or biblical studies is the naturalist approach. Here, the idea is that all the plagues can be explained as natural phenomena, and references are frequently made to the massive eruption of the volcano Thera in the 15th century BCE. Such an eruption, it is hypothesized, could have accounted for nearly all the plagues as well as the drying of the Red Sea thanks to secondary tsunamis, earthquakes, winds, clouds of ash, and diseases caused by water contamination. Ironically, this approach is popular among both apologists and detractors of the biblical story. For the apologist, it affirms that the plagues really happened in historical time, even if the primary miracle was in the auspicious timing of the disasters. For the detractor, it provides a mundane, non-magical fact from which the exaggerated biblical myth could have arisen. The open-minded public is also drawn to such explanations. It's always fun to imagine that ancient myths like Atlantis, the Great Flood, and the plagues of Egypt actually occurred in some historical sense. And using science to identify a naturalistic cause feels like the big reveal in a mystery novel. However, you will rarely find any discussion of such theories in academic commentaries on Exodus, and they are not taken seriously by academia. Miller and Hayes in a 1986 book state, In our opinion, these theories presuppose such hypothetical scenarios such a catastrophic view of history, and such marvelous correlations of coincidental factors that they create more credibility problems of their own than the ones they are intended to solve. William Propp puts his finger on what I think is an even bigger problem with naturalistic explanations. Rationalistic explanations for miracles are anachronistic today. To believe that the Bible faithfully records a concatenation of improbable events as interpreted by a pre-scientific society demands a perverse fundamentalism that blindly accepts the antiquity and accuracy of biblical tradition while denying its theory of supernatural intervention. More recently, Mark Harris has noted the selective way that biblical texts are treated in order to obtain a fit with the hypothesis, a perennial feature of naturalistic explanations. There are chronological issues as well since the eruption of Thera occurred a few centuries too early to fit the Bible's internal timeline. This misguided approach gets applied to other Bible passages with large-scale miracles as well, including Joshua's long day and Noah's flood. It faces the same defects in every instance. 
Another explanation, sometimes provided by non-scholarly sources, is that the ten plagues represent attacks from Yahweh against ten specific Egyptian gods. But very few serious scholars hold this view today. A recent example of this view is found in a Nikkei children's publication, Bible Stories, The Illustrated Guide, according to which some scholars interpret the plagues as challenges to specific Egyptian gods. It then lists the ten plagues along with the associated god or goddess. The water becoming blood is an attack on either Knum, the guardian of the Nile, or Hapi, the god of the Nile's annual flooding. The frogs are a challenge to Heket, the frog goddess. The gnats represent Geb, the god of the earth, and so on. It is true that a very small number of scholars have promoted this view, such as John Currid, who assigns the god Kepri to both the gnats and the flies, and proposes no fewer than seven options for the deity targeted by the livestock plague. It should be clear that these assignations are made haphazardly on the basis of flimsy logic. Yes, Heket, the Egyptian goddess of fertility, is sometimes depicted in Egyptian art as having the face of a frog. But she's not the goddess of frogs, so it's not clear how an overabundance of frogs would offend her. Exodus itself mentions no Egyptian god by name. F.P. Greifenhagen remarks that such interpretations likely assume more detailed knowledge of Egyptian religion than the producers of the final text had. Now, it is true that in the very last plague, Yahweh states that he will strike down every firstborn and execute judgment on Egypt's gods. But as Prop remarks in his commentary, Yahweh's announcement is that he will punish Egypt's gods, not that he has punished some of them. The Mosaic Law's insistence that the firstborn of all livestock and humans belong to Yahweh might be in view here. By killing the firstborn, Yahweh is depriving the Egyptian gods of what belongs to them. In summary, the plague story of Exodus is the end result of a complicated process that probably used Assyrian vassal treaties as a model for God's covenant with Israel, threatening sevenfold curses for disobedience. These were then recontextualized and combined with a tradition about Egyptian diseases to illustrate God's triumph over Pharaoh and Israel's escape from bondage. Mmm. Mmm. These are the juiciest frogs I've ever eaten. Mmm. Ra has rewarded my cruelty to the slaves. It's a plague, you moron. And we got lots more planned. And there's nothing you can do.